like to thank uh, CrossRef for having me here today as part of the panel. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, and I just want to take a second before I get started to thank Anna and everyone at uh, CrossRef who, who helped arrange the, uh, the conference. This is my first CrossRef meeting. I'm very impressed. And uh, I think we should give them all a hand. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, I also think it's, it's I, so I'm a self-professed peer review geek, um, and I think it's really cool and appropriate that we're having this panel on peer review today here at the Royal Society, because um, I believe it was Henry Oldenburg in 1665, um, and I think Laurie had a picture of the, the journal here, uh, Philosophical Transactions. Many, many people agree that that, that's, that was kind of the first case of a journal using peer review, and it evolved from there. If I'm butchering any of those facts, somebody please please correct me. So um, I think it's really great that we're, we're speaking um, about peer review here, here at this location. So what is Preval? Preval is a service that works with the publisher and journal to provide independent uh, validation of the peer review process. Um, it's a badge similar to Crossmark uh, that journals can display in a variety of locations um, at the TOC, it can be a text link, it can be an image at the article level, and so on. It's a signal to uh, readers that peer review has been conducted in the manner that the journal has said it would conduct peer review. And it does a bit more than that as well, which I'll show you in a few minutes. Um, it's a window into a given journal's peer review process that's accessible by the end user. Um, and it answers the most basic, and I think one of the most important questions about scholarly works, has this article really been peer-reviewed. <clears throat> Before I get into the details of, about Preval and the services we're offering, um, I wanted to just briefly touch on uh, some of the problems we're trying to address with Preval. And it's not just, it, it's things I think that everyone in the scholarly publishing world um, are struggling with. Uh, it seems like traditional peer review and scholarly publishers seem to be under constant criticism and, and attack. Uh, we hear it over and over again. Peer review is broken. Peer review doesn't work. Peer review poisons science. All journal publishers are evil. Um, on and on and on. So what are, what are some of the things that seem to be contributing to this negative attitude about peer review and scholarly publishing? Well, we've seen the emergence of predatory publishers over the last few years. These are journals which claim to utilize peer review. Uh, but in fact, do not. I'm sure most or all of you are familiar with this trend. Um, they're scams. They exist um, primarily to collect author fees from uh, authors who are under increasing pressure in the publisher parish environment. Um, and more recently, it seems to me, uh, I think something to keep an eye on is some of these predatory journals seem to be also becoming a kind of a forum for, uh, I, I don't know, lack of a better term, quackery. Um, so that these researchers who were promoting their own agenda, somebody mentioned the anti-vaccine movement early. These are things they can, they can, they can publish in these journals um, and point to them. Um, so that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, we've also had some high-profile cases of uh, faulty research being published uh, in high-profile journals, which seem to support the case that the system is flawed. And then adding to the confusion, we have non-peer-reviewed pieces appearing in peer-reviewed journals. It's not uncommon for journals to have uh, article types or sections which are not peer-reviewed, commentaries, journalistic pieces, things like that. And it's not always clear to the user how to distinguish one from the other. Um, and then we have some neat catchphrases and buzzwords out there um, floating around, such as publish then filter, and publishing is a button uh, that the critics like to use when making uh, their case against peer review and journal publishers. Um, those are two quotes from Clay Shirky that I think the critics use a little bit out of context when making their argument. Published and filter refers to this idea that we should just put everything up online and let anyone and everyone comment on it, and in theory, the cream will rise to the top. Um, I think self-publishing, that idea is fine if you're publishing, you know, self-publishing the uh, Next great, the next Hunger Games or Fifty Shades of Grey or, or whatever, but in my opinion, I'm not so sure it's the best idea all the time uh, for scholarly works. Uh, publishing as a button refers to the idea that, well, with technology today, everything is so, so cheap and easy, uh, a researcher could just put their work up on a blog or a website or whatever, um, 
So what do we even need journals or publishers for anymore? And these are some high profile examples. Um, there are certainly many, many more, and I'm not, we're limited for time, I'm not gonna go through all of these. Um, but again, these are the high profile examples that the critics point to when making their case. Um, feed the, they feed the boogeyman or the urban myth that uh, peer review is broken, the sky is falling, everybody hates peer review. Um, again, I'm not gonna go through all of these, um, but I'm sure by now everyone's familiar with the Bohannon sting from last year. Uh, more recently, we had uh, one journal needing to retract over 60 articles because of what's become known as a peer review ring. Um, and just a couple days ago, that, that same situation happened again. If you're familiar with Retraction Watch, there was an article on there. Same thing happened. An author somehow managed to create fake reviewer accounts, and it looks like he reviewed his own paper. Um, so again, these are high profile extreme examples and I want to stress that this is not an open access problem. This is a problem that affects everybody. It's about peer review. It's not about access model. Um, so in spite of the very vocal negative um, rhetoric and the, the few bad apples who do kind of game the system and ruin it for the rest of us, um, it's important to look at the big picture. Now these are several, these are some stats from multiple surveys. Um, again, because of time limitations, I'm not going to rattle all of them off. Um, but again, let's look at the big picture. I think the numbers support the fact that the overwhelming majority of those in the scholarly community value peer review. Um, real quick, so 91% uh, believe that their last paper was improved as a result of peer review. 84% believe that without peer review there would be no control in scientific communication. Um, and a recent survey, the Author Insight survey, which just came out a couple weeks ago, um, 93% of science authors consider quality of peer review when deciding where to publish. So I think all of this points to the idea, I pulled out a quote from one of the surveys at the bottom, I think the numbers, uh, my, my experience anyway, support the idea that peer review is the central pillar of trust. And this is more important than ever uh, because journal publishing is getting really, really crowded. Over 28,000 journals were published last year. This number continues to grow. Uh, nearly 2 million articles published. And this huge pool of content is made up of, of different access models, uh, different approaches to peer review, um, and a variety of um, level of, of, uh, of uh, quality. So it's also important to point out that peer review isn't one thing. Uh, as we're going to hear, and it, and it can't be assumed. What I mean by that is just because a journal says it conducts peer review, as we all know, doesn't mean that it does. That's the first assumption. The other assumption is that um, I, I think many in the, in, uh, feel that if journal A conducts peer review one way, they expect journal B and journal C to conduct peer review the same way, and that is not the truth. In fact, it's probably the opposite of the truth. Um, there isn't just one right way to peer review, although there are some weaker or non-existent approaches. Um, Preprint archives, we're gonna hear from Richard in, in a little bit. Traditional pre-publication peer review, open peer review, post-publication peer review, um, these other efforts we're gonna hear about, peer review science and, and frontiers. These are all valid approaches to peer review as long as they're conducted ethically um, and the way they're supposed to be conducted. The problem is that, one of the problems is, that journals that do have high standards, regardless of what their approach approach to peer review is, they currently have no way uh, to show this or to get credit for the hard work that they do. There are these trends toward um, light peer review and the critics, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, which are dominating the discussion while it seems that quality is finding a harder time, uh, having a harder time finding a voice. So how do we give voice to the various legitimate approaches, um, increase trust and transparency in a way that's convenient, fair, and hopefully unbiased? So how do we do that? Well, we use tools for this in our, in our everyday life all the time. We have energy guides, nutrition labels, and I just learned here for the first time here in London that there's something called the uh, Campaign for Real Ale camera, um, which is a tool they use here to, to evaluate um, ale. Um, and I can tell you based on last night that it works pretty good. Um, so again, we can compare uh, the, the uh, journal, the pu publishing system to other industries. In the journal industry, for example, um, we have a number of things we consider when we're selecting a car. And the same thing applies to a journal. 
authors, readers, reviewers, librarians all have a number of existing and new tools that they use um, when they're making their evaluation. Um, and we think PRE fits into this ecosystem. I'm pressed for time, so I'm going to hurry up a little bit. Uh, in terms of this ecosystem, there are several groups um, that exist, uh, such as Crossref or Emerging, which have similar goals uh, in that we all want to educate and support the community around peer, peer review, scholarly publishing, and the practices and standards around that. Um, so we're working, to, we're working together with um, some of these organizations on a variety of initiatives. Um, I'm actually going to skip over this um, because I'm pressed for time, but uh, briefly, we want to create incentives to use best practices in, in peer review. We want to recognize journals that have an editor-in-chief or somebody with oversight, encourage journals to use quality reviewers. That seems obvious, but it's not always the case. Um, and again, help promote practices which are markers of commitment uh, to better peer review approaches. Um, Again, I'm going to spend about 15 seconds on this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on technical mumbo jumbo, uh, but I do want to briefly explain how it works. First thing we do is we meet with the journal and the people involved in the peer review process to learn what your peer review flow is like. Um, from there, there's little or no work or resources that the journal has to invest in getting set up. We, real, we realize it's uh, important for us to make it as painless and easy as possible for journals to participate in preval. So we do all the heavy lifting. We work with your, uh, if you use a third party provider for your manuscript submission and peer review system and your hosting platform, we, we work all that out. And I, again, I'm pressed for time. So if you'd like more details about how, how it works, please, please, uh, uh, we can address it during the Q&A. You, you can see me later. Okay, so now, I'm going to do what Jeff Builder advised against yesterday uh, and attempt a live online demo. Very quick. Oh, I think I got it. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can stretch this out a little bit more. I'm thinking press the screen button. Okay. I am not, as you can see, I'm not a Mac person. Oops. I'm using up my last couple of minutes figuring this Sorry. out. Um, so the American Diabetes Association is one of the early adopters of Preval. Um, and here, you know, we've got your, your, um, you know, your, your typical online table of contents, everything, all the usual suspects. But what's new is if you scroll down to the articles which are peer-reviewed is this link to Preval. And at the article level, you know, uh, again, similar to Crossmark, we have the Preval badge. Just the appearance of Preval, Let's the user know, hey, this was peer reviewed. It's not just the journal saying it was peer reviewed. That peer review process was validated by an independent third party, PRE. Um, but, and the, as far as placement of the badge and things like that, we, you know, it's flexible for JBJS. It it's, may go over here. Um, but again, I just want to point out that it's flexible. Um, by clicking the badge, we open up a new window. And this is where the journal can display more information about these best practices I alluded to and the peer review process. So, um, and again, this is customizable. It depends on the journal and the discipline, but is the journal member of COPE? Do they use reviewers who have registered ORCID IDs? Do they follow guidelines um, that are endorsed by the Equator Network? Things like that. If this was an open access journal, we could display if they were a member of OASPA or the Directory of Open Access Journals. And then down here, uh, we have information related to the peer review process. So what type of peer review? Was it single blind, double blind, open review? Was the article screened for plagiarism? What roles participated in the peer review process? Um, and then the, if the journal wants to, there's optional information they can display. So if the journal wants to, hopefully this will work, display the, um, here we go, the reviewer names and the reviewer comments, uh, that were submitted during peer review, they can do that. Um, again, I want to stress that's optional. That's up to the journal. If the journal does not want to display the reviewer um, names or the reviewer comments or the reviewer information, we don't display it. We do not even store that metadata. So, let me get back. I'm pretty much done. Am I over? Yeah. You. Presenter view, got it. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, so we don't need these because the online demo worked. Um, so thank you. I hope I... <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I had four seconds left, so uh, I look forward to any questions or comments, good, bad, indifferent, um, anyone may have. Um, I guess we could do that at the end because I want to be sensitive to everyone else's time. Okay. Thank you.